I am going to make history here uh, as the first president to live tweet. From politics. Another day, another tweet storm here for Donald Trump. To entertainment. You guys are on uh, Twitter, right? To activism. Twitter has become a staple of our modern society. I don't think that there's ever been a tool before in the history of mankind where you can just so easily share what you got to say with so many people so quickly. I just wanted to see everything that was happening, not just where people were, but what, what they were doing, you know, and I wanted to be able to see the world in real time. With its sheer volume of content disseminated in more than 40 languages, Twitter has become an online running feed for recording our global history. But the social platform's success has not come without questions around the company's profitability and growth, and controversy around its role in deciding what content should and should not be broadcast to its 166 million daily active users. In 2006, Twitter was born out of the ashes of another San Francisco startup called Odeo. The company was trying to do like internet radio, but it wasn't really panning out and they were running out of money. But in 2005, it became clear that Odeo couldn't compete with Apple's iTunes. So that's when they turned to all the employees and they said that if you have an idea, now is the time to try it. And at the time, one of the engineers, Jack Dorsey, he spoke up about his idea to essentially let users send out a broad text message to folks uh, through this thing called Twitter. Twitter's 140 character limit was originally inspired by the length limit of SMS messages. This would later be expanded to 280 characters. By March 2006, Dorsey had created a working prototype of the platform and sent his first tweet out into the world. Where the company really started to gain a foothold with the mainstream was in 2007 at the South by Southwest event in Austin. During the event, Twitter tripled its traffic from 20,000 to 60,000 tweets per day. That same year, Dorsey was officially voted in as Twitter CEO, a title which he didn't hold on to for very long. He was very young, very green, and he wasn't particularly polished as CEO. This led to his ouster in 2008. Twitter co-founder Evan Williams took the reins of the company after Dorsey's departure. In 2010, he was succeeded by Dick Costello, formerly Twitter's chief operating officer. Three years later, Costello took the company public. The stock had an astounding first day of trading, which pushed Twitter's market capitalization above $32 billion. At the time, its market cap was larger than 337 companies in the S&P 500. By then, Twitter had grown to a company of more than 2,000 employees and more than 200 million active users. But the good times didn't last forever. Twitter shares plunging on Tuesday as the company's first quarter earnings leaked early and show the weakest revenue growth since its IPO. Feeling the pressure, Costello made the decision to step down as CEO in June of 2015. He was succeeded by a familiar face at the company. It wasn't until 2015 that Dorsey was finally brought back in. And during that period, he really had to prove his worth. He did a very Steve Jobs move and that he went and founded another company, uh, Square in this case, that really took off and showed that Dorsey wasn't a one-hit wonder. That same year, Twitter would take on a new role as the megaphone for the soon-to-be leader of the free world. I am officially running for president of the United States. During his campaign, Donald Trump used Twitter as a public square to promote ideas that appealed to his base, as a weapon to attack his opponents, and as a tool to lash out at the media. Then suddenly, his tweets became the mouthpiece for a sitting president. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. When Trump was running for president, Trump had lots of ways to kind of go into attack mode and, and exercise his audience. He could, he could do press interviews, he could do rallies. As soon as he became president, a lot of those avenues of communicating directly to the public were closed off to Trump. And so in some ways, Twitter was the only thing left for him. As president, Trump's Twitter use has not changed much. According to New York and the New York Times, President Trump has insulted 459 people, places, and things on Twitter. Trump has often been criticized for his comments on Twitter, like when he told four minority Democratic congresswomen to go back to the crime-infested places from where they came, as well as promoting conspiracy theories, like the one about MSNBC host Joe Scarborough having something to do with the death of a former staffer. If you could come up with an ideal 
medium of communication for Donald Trump, it would be Twitter. It really encourages people, if they want to get noticed, and they want to get attention, to say something outrageous, abrasive, very partisan, something that grabs people emotionally. And besides rallying his base, Trump's Twitter feed has come to set the national dialogue. Trump, in, in some ways, is very sophisticated in that he tends to tweet early in the morning or early in the day. And then that, that immediately from the, from the morning talk shows on all day, in, in many cases, sets the agenda for what people talk about. Trump has even used Twitter to threaten other countries. President Trump now raising that temperature in a fiery tweet after Kim Jong-un threatened he had a nuclear button and the U.S. in his range. President Trump writing, will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I too have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. President Trump has really pushed the boundaries for what is allowed to be said on social media. So to deal with world leaders like President Trump, Twitter actually introduced a new policy in October 2019 that outlines what is and what is not allowed from these users. Some instances where Twitter says it is more likely to remove a tweet is if the tweet promotes terrorism, violence and suicide, or self-harm, or if it's used in any illegal activity or for manipulating or interfering with elections. But for the most part, Twitter gives a lot of leeway to elected officials. Twitter argues that world leaders, what they say has so much value that oftentimes it's better to err on the side of leaving things up for the sake of the newsworthiness and how important that is to their constituents. But most recently, Twitter placed a label on a Trump tweet, saying that the tweet violated the platform's policies against abusive behavior. Trump's tweet said that those who try to create an autonomous zone in Washington, D.C. will, quote, be met with serious force. Twitter and Facebook also removed a doctored viral video of two toddlers shared by President Trump after one of the parents issued a copyright complaint. When talking about the Black Lives Matters protesters in a recent tweet, President Trump said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And that was really close to violating Twitter's line saying that they did not allow any content from world leaders in regards to clear and direct threats of violence. Twitter reacted by putting Trump's tweet behind a warning. The company also curtailed the tweet's reach. It can still be viewed and retweeted with a comment, but users cannot like, reply to, or retweet it. That was something that we hadn't really seen before, and it certainly drew the ire of President Trump. In general, it's obviously something he's viscerally upset about, because Twitter is so important, not only to his presidency, but I think by now to his personality. Just a day earlier, Trump, who was already upset with Twitter for placing fact-check labels on his tweets about mail-in ballots, signed an executive order aimed at curtailing the liability protection that large social media companies get through Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. One of the key provisions of the act is something called conduit immunity. This is court-created law from the 1940s, which basically says, if you are just the intermediary, you are now responsible for the content that is transmitted. Think of it as a library, not being liable for the content of its books. But the more important provision is the second section, which made clear that platforms could moderate content. They could remove lewd, lascivious, or otherwise objectionable content without assuming liability for either the removal of that content or the failure to catch any content that, the, that they didn't remove. Trump's executive order is already being challenged and its limits questioned. Public opinion on the matter seems to be split. A recent report found that 66% of Americans support keeping Section 230, but 8 in 10 Americans don't trust internet companies to police the content on their platforms. We have this medium that was fashioned for just casual, innocuous sharing of thoughts and pictures among friends, suddenly being used for political speech. And I think you know, I, I think Twitter was completely unprepared for that, never had that idea in mind. And so Twitter has struggled, as have other social media, with their role in policing political speech. Though Twitter's approach to regulating political speech has been a bit stricter than its rivals, it's still plagued with hate speech and disinformation. Recently, companies like Unilever, Coca-Cola, Starbucks, and others have halted advertising on social media platforms, demanding companies do more to stop hate for profit. 
Twitter's ability to amplify messages at lightning speed has also made it a useful tool for social movements. People use a number of different ways to engage politically on social media. So we see that people are using hashtags. They're also asking other people to take action on an issue. And you also see people using social media to find rallies and protests in their area. We first started to see Twitter be used in an activist type of way uh, during the Arab Spring uh, that started uh, you know, back in 2010. That's kind of like the first moment where people really took to the service to get movements going, to spread hashtags, and just get, you know, people motivated. And though the Me Too movement started in 2006, it exploded on Twitter in 2017, after actress Alyssa Milano urged victims of sexual abuse to share their stories. The hashtag Me Too went viral in the wake of accusations of misconduct against Hollywood executive Harvey Weinstein. The Black Lives Matter hashtag first gained traction on Twitter in 2013, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who shot and killed unarmed black teenager Trayvon Martin in Florida. Since then, the hashtag has transformed into a roaring cry, usually used in connection with police-related deaths of black Americans. On May 28th alone, there were 8.8 .8 million Twitter posts that use the hashtag. Black social media users are more likely than other groups to say that social media is personally important for them to get involved with issues that they care about. They're also more likely to say that social media can help hold powerful people accountable. But how effective social media activism is remains a big question. On one hand, you do see a majority of Americans in our 2018 survey said that social media was a way to get voices that are often underrepresented for their voices to be heard. At the same time, 71% of participants in the survey said that they thought that social media makes people feel as if they're making a difference, when they're actually not. Even as it's become a useful tool for change, Twitter has not grown in the same way as other social media competitors. Growth has been an issue for Twitter for quite a while and throughout its history. For a while, the company was stuck at 300 million monthly active users. It was essentially a number that refused to go up. User numbers for Twitter are crucial, since that's how the company makes money. Advertising is Twitter's biggest revenue stream, and within that, video ads are actually the fastest growing part of Twitter's advertising. When you think about the user base, the larger the base, obviously, uh, the more opportunities you have um, to attract advertisers. Compared to other social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, Twitter has a significantly lower user base. And while Facebook's stock has soared, Twitter's stock reached its peak shortly after it IPO'd and has remained at about half of its peak value ever since. The reason Twitter is smaller than its peers, one is, I think, a legacy of not improving its tech and product. I think as you've gone forward, they've gotten much more comfortable with iterating the product. And so it's playing catch up. You know, when Trump took office, Twitter was in a really tough spot. They were losing executives. Twitter shares lower this morning by about 4%. CEO Jack Dorsey says four amazing executives have chosen to leave the company, including the heads of product, engineering, and media. There was high turnover. There was a lot of concern. And that's why Twitter's stock was sort of broken and it had to sort of collapse towards its lows. Disney had passed on buying it. Salesforce had passed on buying it. And Google passed on buying it. And, you know, I think in many ways, sort of the product changes at Twitter combined with it becoming more and more of a platform for um, information and to communicate information, whether from the president or from athletes or you know whatever it may be. I think all of that created sort of this perfect storm of events to reinvigorate Twitter. As part of this reinvigoration, Twitter focused on making its platform easier to use. When you open up Twitter, the machine learning and the AI has made it easier for you to just see what you're interested in versus historically it was hunting and pecking and trying to find the information that you were interested in. Just a few years ago, it was a reverse chronology, right? Like you just saw tweets in real time and, and whether they were interesting to you or not, now it's all about showing you what you care about. Topics lets users see tweets about a certain interest, say sports, without having to follow individual accounts. This makes starting out on the platform a little easier. Twitter's Explore tab puts trending topics, news, and search in one place and is now location relevant. The company is also testing fleets. Similar to Instagram stories, these tweets disappear within 24 hours of being posted. And the most recent addition lets users record a tweet using audio, though the feature came under fire initially for not being accessible to individuals with hearing problems. 
Some have also criticized Twitter for harassment and the spread of misinformation. You know, most Americans do not trust the kind of news that they get on social media. We also see that, you know, majorities are concerned about things like cyberbullying and harassment. There's also concerns uh, when it relates to digital privacy and data collections. For many years, the service was plagued by how harmful the content could be to users in terms of harassment. People will just slide in your DMs and say hateful things. They'll They'll, you know, call you all sorts of slurs and whatnot. And there was no way to really shield yourself from it other than getting off of the app. But Twitter has taken steps to mitigate hateful exchanges. Over the years, we have seen them introduce features where you can essentially mute words that perhaps you just don't ever want to hear. You can mute users. You can block users. And the platform's changes seem to be paying off. From a, a growth standpoint, user-wise, Twitter is now by far the fastest growing company in the space, outpacing the global growth you're seeing at Snapchat and Facebook. About 25% year-over-year growth. These are growth rates that investors just never, never believed could occur. And some investors see Twitter as a good bet for the future. Obviously, Twitter is challenged in the current environment because a lot of events have been canceled and a lot of the big brands have pulled back on advertising. But the growth in the user base, that's not going to go away. On top of it, the event lineup for 2021 and 2022, because of the compression and how things got pushed out, is going to lead to tremendous amounts of opportunities for Twitter to monetize that larger user base in 21 and 22. So if you're looking out, you know, this quarter is going to be tough. Next quarter is going to be tough. As you look out to 21 and 22, if you have patience, Twitter is going to be a great stock.